Hello and welcome to Fire Headlines, where we cover the hottest topics in fire service news. I'm your host, Samantha Didion, and joining me on the panel today is Chief Bob Horton, Chief Byron Kennedy, and Dr. Matt Hines Aldrich. Chief Jeff Buchanan is away this week. But as you can see, we're throwing some new names in the mix today. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Bob, to introduce today's additional panel members. Well, thank you, Samantha. It's great to be back on Fire Headlines and to talk about a real exciting topic. And we brought these two guests specifically because they have intimate knowledge around this particular article. Uh, really want to welcome Chief Byron Kennedy, retired deputy chief of, of the Atlanta Fire Department. We are going to go to Atlanta to hear about this interesting story about apartments being built above a fire station. And and then joining is Dr. Matt Hines Aldridge, who is a, a, an evangelist of community risk reduction. I have been paying attention to him for at least, I'd say, about a decade when I first learned about a lot of his great work. And uh, not just on, on risk, I mean, risk reduction, yes, but, but the deep level of, of analysis that he provides on risk. So I always love his, his thoughts. He's also done a lot of research in this area of mixed use fire stations. So he's going to have some great insight to us. Matt is a senior risk strategy lead at the American Association of Insurance Services, but he too had a history at Atlanta Fire Department and I'll let him talk talk about that when we get to that part. So gentlemen, it is such a pleasure to have you on Fire Headlines. Thanks for joining us. And I'll echo that. Thank you both for being here today, because like Bob mentioned, your guys' experience and expertise will really be valuable with today's topic as we discuss mixed-use fire stations. Midtown Atlanta Fire Station is set to undergo renovation to have apartments built on top. And judging by the Fox News package accompanying this article, a lot of the public seems shocked to hear this new development. Chief Kennedy, what's going on in, in Midtown Atlanta? What's going on in Atlanta? And, and just share with us like some of your thoughts about, about this particular story. You, you worked there almost nearly 30 years. Uh, share with us some of your perspective here. Yes, uh, sure will. Uh, the big issue is that Living downtown, we refer to it as downtown. That's a larger area, of course, being downtown within the city blocks. But living downtown has notoriously been expensive. It's, it, it is expensive. No ifs and buts about it. Even growing up as a child, growing up in the city of Atlanta, you never thought. I never thought of living downtown. And then when we talk about Midtown, where there are a lot of restaurants now, there's, of course, the park right there. There's a lot of foot traffic. There's a lot of bars. There's, I mean, it's a lot of entertainment uh, in that immediate area where Station Number 15 is located. Now, I'm very familiar with Station 15 as I, from time to time, would fill in there over the past three decades of working there. I can tell you that that's a busy station. So the neighborhood needs that station. No, no ifs, ands, buts about it. Now, Station 15 is not one of our older stations, but it is one of those stations that's been around for a long time. It's been there my entire career. So we know it's at least 30 years old. Uh, Dr. Um, Matt may be familiar with the age of that station, but uh, it's definitely greater than 30 for sure. Um, I will say that the uh, the concept of um, adding apartments on top of it, you know, the first thing is that uh, for the city of Atlanta to, to decide to build a complex that incorporates housing as well as a fire station, that's going to be a good deal for them. And it's tough for us to get fire. And I say I'm saying us because it was us for 30 years, but it's tough for the city of Atlanta firefighters to to get new stations. That's a reality across the nation. Uh, it's super expensive and uh, it's a very, very long process. So uh, this is one way we can get our foot in the door and, and get a new station. Uh, those stations are are built to last, but they are they're only built to last for so long. And I think um, Station 15 is it's time for a new one. That'd be awesome. That's right, Chief. Thank you. And and. You're exactly right. Cost of construction is high and uh, particularly in these populated urban areas, there's only so much space to build. And if the communities are going to grow and affordable housing and so on and so forth, I think we got to do something about it. Matt, the, the one of the residents in the article says apartments doesn't make any sense. Does it make sense? 
Yeah, it does actually. I would uh, caveat it saying I'm not sure that in rebuilding a station there, there's lots of logistical things that may not make sense, but absolutely building apartments on top of uh, fire stations or, and frankly, it is, let's extend this out. There are other things beyond beyond apartments. Affordable housing in Midtown, Man, uh, Midtown Atlanta is definitely um, an absolute need and is a major uh, challenge and, and uh, frankly, a big political concern there. But frankly, we're seeing this across the country. It's not just a- apartments that are going over. We can talk about this later, but there's lots and lots of different types of ideas and really innovative kind of mixed use fire stations. But it definitely makes a lot of sense. But there are definitely lots of considerations and it's not a easy fix. And so, uh, but I'm glad, uh, I'm glad the city is stepping up to do this. Something I've wanted to see them do for a long time. Yeah. And it sounded like maybe this isn't the first time Atlanta has experienced with mixed use facilities or fire stations. Is there some history there that you can tell us about? Yeah, actually, uh, it was sort of referred to in the article as uh, a new and, and you know never been tried before. But in fact, actually, Atlanta does have a really successful a uh, long-term uh, model of using of what's like what we would consider a mixed-use fire station. So, uh, Atlanta Fire Station Three up in uh, Buckhead is actually a fire station, a standalone fire station, but it's it's basically within and sort of surrounded by a mall parking lot, kind of multi-story uh, parking lot. And so, and that's been around so long. In fact, when the mall expanded, they needed the land that old fire station was on. And so they actually built a new fire station within another part of the parking garage that they uh, uh, were expanding. So I forget exactly how long it's been now, but somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 years or more, maybe even longer than that, Atlanta has had a fire station in a parking garage, which is effectively a another really innovative use of, of kind of a mixed use fire station. Samantha, you might remember when in Southern Oregon, we built a fire station and we were doing all the community, you know, outreach uh, and things that, that you should do when we were planning that. And, you know, we had residents that were concerned and I think appropriately so at the you know noise uh, created by a fire station. And what I found, I mean, kind of humorous after the fact is we were building the fire station in conjunction with a middle school. The middle school was already there. So I can't imagine for one second that the firefighters could be noisier than a, than middle school, but we do operate there 24 seven and the school, the school doesn't chief Kennedy, what are, what are your thoughts about the, the noise? You know, the, I mean, the, you're living above a fire station, even in the, in the article, they just went right to the siren. I guess I reflect a little bit. If you live in an urban downtown area, it, sirens is just normal part of the, of the day. Like that's happening around the clock. So it's probably no different. I don't know. Did you have any thoughts on just what would it like be like to live above? I mean, you lived in a fire station. So you at least you, you, you know, that part of it, what do you, what do you think about being the fire station's neighbor? No, I, I tell you, you're absolutely right. I recall back when I was a captain and this was back in, I don't know, Oh, four or five. We, uh, we had, it was a pretty, um, I won't say heated, but it was, uh, it was very, very well debated at least about firefighters using our sirens leaving out of the station. And guess what station we're talking about? It was specifically Station 15. Uh, and now there are even more apartment buildings. I mean, I don't know, 40, 50, 40 story buildings all around that that fire station that wasn't there when I was new on the job. So uh, I'm sure the, the concerns are still being expressed. But yeah, it, it, it happens. And it's obviously illegal for us to travel emergency without those lights and sirens, not just lights only. And that's what the residents were actually offering, saying, hey, can't you guys and girls ride down the street with just your lights until you get away from our building and then turn on the siren? But unfortunately, it, it doesn't It doesn't work that way. So uh, it's a real concern. It's a real concern. But uh, I will say that I've been in one of the buildings near the fire station when they were responding to an alarm And, you know, the newer buildings are not totally insulated, if you will, but the sound reduction is is considerable compared to a regular residential. And that being the heart of downtown Atlanta, um, many of you already know that when we catch an alarm, we we, I don't say we send the world, but we send multiple units 
And it's not just going to be those two units or three units that are in that particular station. It's going to be others that are coming right down the street going to that same alarm as well. So, yeah, it's a real it's a real concern for for residents. But some people prefer to have that trade off and, and others don't really uh, want it. So can I jump in on that? Because uh, there's definitely this NIMBY issue with this. And, and if you're not familiar with the acronym, it's uh, not in my backyard. It's sort of everyone wants the various different social services, but of course they don't want it you know, in their backyard. And this has come up numerous times. And in fact, actually, when I was in the city nine years ago, uh, we had actually proposed a mixed use fire station uh, in an area slightly north of this that was not well covered. Uh, and in fact, it was sort of a, a, a gap area that we just could not get to. It was an area called Peachtree Battle in the city of Atlanta. Uh, and and the thing to know about Peachtree Battle is that it's a pocket of extreme wealth. Not the wealthiest part of Atlanta, but it's pretty close. Um, and so the prospect of, uh, of putting a fire station, of course, uh, there was concerns about, you know, that they were paying a substantial amount of taxes and 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 having not as as good a service because we we just couldn't get there based on de development and and you know more cars and all this kind of stuff but um understandably nobody wanted a fire station directly next to their multi-million dollar house and so we had proposed a uh, fire station we found a lot uh, and ironically it was a, uh, a restaurant that used to be owned by the celebrity uh um, p diddy or diddy or sean combs or or whatever he's being called these days. But one of the things that was brought up and the, a little anecdote on this was that the gut reaction from the city realtor uh, at the time was, oh gosh, no one would ever want to live above a fire station because of the noise. And again, that everyone just goes right there. But the interesting thing is this same person had just got done talking about five minutes prior to this about, uh, and basically sort of raving about how they were just in the process of building a, um, or signing a deal to build a, a hotel directly between several of the uh, runways at the airport. And so he was on one hand talking about like how amazing this was that they were going to build this hotel and it's going to be very unique directly between two runways. And then it tur immediately turns around and says, uh, when when proposed with the idea, well, could we build a build a fire station with mixed use housing above it? He immediately went to, oh gosh, uh, the the noise would be just too much. And I was like, well, did you not just hear yourself? You, you talked about how great the new modern engineering is in terms of double and triple pane windows and all the other sound barriers and insulation. I would much rather be above a fire station than between two runways. But uh, uh, but again, so I, I really do think that. It, the, the sound issue is something that is solvable. You know, you, it's sort of just the urban noise that you get used to. Dr. Matt, what do you suppose is maybe the final reason for public officials to use these mixed use fire stations? And how are we going to see this unfold across the country? A, a big part of that is uh, there's two pressures. Uh, and they both come down to economics. We have the need for affordable housing in highly dense urban areas, which is, uh, it, that's not a Atlanta problem. That is a national, it's a global problem. How do you ensure that there is sufficient amounts of uh, housing or, or what they refer to as non-market rate housing that is in places that are close to transportation and all the other in jobs and what have you. So that is one major pressure uh, because again, the economics of real estate economics uh, you know, they would much rather have uh, really expensive apartments that are going to, you know, bring in lots of money. But so you have that pressure at the same time, you have fire departments that are uh, trying to figure out how to justify building new fire stations. Like uh, Station 15 may not necessarily be the oldest fire station in the city of Atlanta, but it's certainly not a new one. And it, and there is, you know, wear and tear. And this is a problem, again, across the country. So how do you replace a fire station? And a key part of that is, we need floor level access and maybe sec like second story access. Anything above that, you know, whatever, <laughs> basically. Uh, and so as long as we have enough road level access and can, you know, um, have our bays and, and have places for sleeping and everything, that uh, um, the air rights above it, we don't like need to worry about that. And then the other part is there's another consideration. Again, that all comes back to, back to economics. The other consideration is, say, for example, you have a one acre or two acre uh, lot that you turn into a fire station. You take that uh, uh, parcel out of circulation and out of revenue generation in perpetuity, basically 40 or 50 years, the city is not going to get any sort of revenue from that uh, parcel. So not only does it cost a whole lot of money to buy the parcel, 
then you have to build the build the station again that's more money but then you also are not uh, recuperating any of that money and so that's really why a lot of cities are kind of saying well we have all this air above our fire station if we can get somebody even better yet if we can get somebody else to build the fire station for us and in fact that's what is happening in many many of these communities that's the kind of the key part that often gets kind of glossed over is that a lot of times there are deals that are being done and then not I don't say that in some sort of nefarious way, but uh, but basically they'll say we will streamline the process of getting all the permits and making sure that you can actually get shovels in the ground quicker. And, and in many cases, there'll be kind of like benefits for the developer. But in, in the process, you are also going to have to build us a fire station as part of that complex. Yeah, I'll say the um, the wild part is everyone knows well, most people have heard of the city of Atlanta before, but many people really don't know that the city of Atlanta proper is roughly 135 square miles. I mean, it's it's not a big geographical city. It's actually a rather small piece of land and a nighttime population, maybe just over a half a million daytime pre-pandemic was probably just over two million in the city of Atlanta proper. Uh, not considering Metro Atlanta, but so there's nowhere else really to go except but to grow upward, as as mentioned earlier. I had a, a friend of mine who, you know, fire chief struggling to get just buy in from mayor and council on building a fire station. And and he was sharing with me, yeah, the mayor, she's just, you know, really is prioritizing a library. And I don't know that you know, Mixie certainly wasn't original thought. I'm sure I read Matt's article and started the, the brainstorm hit. And I was like, oh, my gosh, like, why aren't we using fire stations in collaboration with other partnerships? And you highlighted great points of even pie growing negotiations with developers that are saving, you know, reducing costs to build the fire station makes perfect sense. So as you could imagine in that story, I recommended my friends to go back to the mayor and say, let's do a library fire station. Like let's put, you know, build a, a library that has a fire station as, as part of it and see if you can't get that across, across the, uh, the finish line. You know, Matt, in your research on this, what are you seeing? Like what types of mixed use. I mean, probably some commercial space, even in the article talked about, you know, I get it, a Starbucks and so on. Uh, what are you seeing as some of these creative mixed use experiences and, and, and Chief Kennedy weigh in as well? Because you're in consulting now team with different fire chiefs and communities. They got to be having similar challenges. Matt, start with you and Chief Kennedy, share what you're hearing from fire chiefs. Sure. So it is amazing how um, diverse the different ideas in fact actually re very recently i heard of the one that is probably i find the most unique mixed use fire station ever and there's somewhere in ohio they actually have a fire station a single a uh, single base station that's actually in the base of a water tower i was just blown away when i saw that but besides that actually there's uh, different types of uh of buildings. So some of them are, are commercial office space. So for example, Boston, frankly, they've had a, a station that's been in the base of a office high rise right in downtown Boston for decades. But uh, the other thing a lot of people don't want is also so, sometimes social services. And so what we're starting to see is a growth in the number of, of places. For example, I believe it's Vancouver that has, uh, they, they partner with a YWCA and built a, uh, a woman's shelter and homeless shelter directly above the fire station. And, and so we also, I believe Fairfax County is currently in the process. I don't know if it's actually, I don't believe it's been built, uh, but I know they're in the process of, of building a, uh, a shelter or, or some variation of that, some sort of social services building in or above a fire station. Um, your, your point about uh, libraries, that's a, a particularly actually a common one, uh, or I think a growing one. Libraries are a politically um, popular topic. And so if getting, getting a bond initiative to build a library is something that uh, um, a lot of communities are willing to support. Sometimes it's a bit more of a hurdle to get uh, a bond initiative to build a fire station. So if you can kind of ride on their coattails. And then the other interesting concept that's becoming quite popular recently is actually putting storage facilities. Uh, I don't know if, if you've uh, been paying attention to the storage facility, like these uh, CubeSmart and all the other various companies whose name I'm sure are going to forget. The, they're putting those places everywhere. But the final one I'll share, and this actually came from the UK, and this is a really innovative model, is... It's actually run by the fire department, uh, a youth engagement place where the after school programs and, and rec halls and gyms and all this other stuff. 
but there's actually a fire station as part of this. As it's just a really phenomenal way of 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 just really thinking outside the box. Yeah, my conversations have been very similar, maybe not as detailed, but I, I can be honest, the vast majority of the fire chiefs or chief officers or even firefighters that are involved with promoting, you know, the need for a fire station uh, or get one re uh, revitalized. Basically, what I'm hearing is I'll take one however we can get it. I'll partner with anybody just to get a fire station. Uh, Dr. Matt mentioned a second ago hurdles. And to be honest, that's a huge hurdle. When I was sitting as number two with this with the uh, fire department, I saw quickly how some of those hurdles can be they're they're real. You know, no one's purposely stop trying to block it, but there are just so many hurdles to getting funding that you need for a fire station. And once you get the funding, then you have the delays. And then by the time it's time to get ready to break ground, well, the price has gone up and you have to go back for more funding. And that's one of the, uh, in my personal opinion, one of the benefits of private companies doing this is, or, or partnering with a private company because they typically move a little bit considerably faster than um, many of our governments do as we put the dollars together to to make things actually happen. I was re recently out on the West Coast, and of course, there's a lot of energy saving concepts and incentives out there. Uh, everything is green out there, if you will uh, consider, you know, you want things to be green uh, or solar powered and so forth. I was talking with one particular fire chief and uh, this individual mentioned that, you know, he said, boy, it, it'll be great if we were able to build a station and partner with a solar company and have the entire station on solar power. And that solar company does this and however they do it, you know, the point is the building would be as a partnership for a dual, for a dual purpose. And the primary purpose is saving energy. Uh, in this case, and then they will get a fire station out of it. So once again, it just goes back to we'll take it however we can and we'll partner with whomever we can. Some people have actually uh, in a conversation really recently, an individual mentioned that why don't we build a fire station out of uh, 3D modeling? They're doing it a lot now. Let's use 3D modeling or 3D printing rather. Uh, and and build a fire station. I'm sure we can get somebody to do it, you know. And and once again, they're, everybody's just trying to say, let's think outside of the the traditional fire department box, if you will, and and get it done. So, yeah, everybody's hungry for new construction. Everybody's hungry for space. In this case, for Atlanta, the community is hungry to get into that midtown area, and uh, the city is is somehow or another they're pushing forward. My understanding, they've already approved the the $100 million to uh, get ready to move forward on that. I don't know how long that $100 million will be enough, but uh, right now it, it, it appears as though it's going to be moving pretty quickly. In fact, they're talking about possibly uh, building, starting building in 2025. So it's going to be interesting. There's one other major caveat that that any fire department or any fire chief or or community that's thinking about doing this really needs to have at the forefront, it, it, which is that yes, the private sector and private developers move at a at a pace that is dramatically faster than local government for building uh, you know physical buildings, but they also change their mind just as fast. And this is one thing I've heard numerous times in sort of delving into this is that sometimes the developers, they're promising to cut a year out of the permits and all the other stuff it takes to get shovels in the ground. Uh, and so, you know, there's an advantage for that. And, and there's maybe these tax write-offs. However, even if they get the shovels in the ground in 2025, there's certainly the cost considerations for labor and, and for materials. But there's also the very possibility that, you know, the housing market tanks or the building market tanks or the access to capital tanks. And so um, that's what I've heard from several places is that they had this grandiose plan. The developer was kind of like uh, had these really beautiful drawings and, and, you know, was saying all the right things. Once they were kind of like on the cusp of beginning construction, 
the developer lost access to capital. They realized that the numbers didn't quite work out. And then they decided to pull the plug on the project. And so then the city is kind of holding the bag like, wait, that was going to be our fire station. What do you mean you're not going to build this high rise after all? And so there needs to be some consideration when when you're talking about all the incentives and all the other ways of encouraging uh, developers to partner this type of project, it really needs to also be some consideration put into requirements and or language, you know, like contractual language that basically says that you can't get halfway through the project and run out of money and just say, well, you know, we got half the building, but then, you know, the bank cut us off and we just walked away because unfortunately sometimes that happens in commercial, in particularly commercial real estate with the market the way it is right now. That is definitely the, the big wild card here that needs to be factored in by communities. Absolutely. Thank you for bringing that up. And before we wrap up today, I want to give the panel some time to share with our listeners any projects they're working on or even material in general that they would like us to know about. Dr. Matt, we'll have you start first. Sure. So actually, I've done a lot of research, uh, background research, trying to find other examples of mixed use fire stations. I uh, Initially, this was just a Word document that was basically intended to uh, um, help the administrators in the city of Atlanta see that this was not a novel concept, but I ended up just putting it on medium.com, which is just a way to self-publish uh, some stuff. So I figured if uh, I've done the research and you know it's out there, and so you can find it, uh, it's the title, Mixed Use Fire Stations. Chief mentioned earlier, I, I do a little bit of consulting since I retired and kind of what I uh, I do now. Um, my biggest problem now when I wake up in the morning is what are we going to eat for dinner? So uh, it's been it's been a blessing, if you will. And uh, but that's that's what I do now. Uh, I've done quite a few sessions on diversity, equity and inclusion. I've done several keynotes and so forth uh, as far as leadership keynotes and so forth. But outside of that, I'm, I'm just enjoying life. I, I still love my fire service, so I'm still heavily involved in that as well. Yeah, I love how humble uh, Chief Kennedy is. Folks, this is a wealth of knowledge and his contributions to the fire service didn't stop on that 30 year on the day retirement. I bet he's as active as ever. Go check him out on his website, kennedyconsultingfirm.com and check out the type of work that he's doing because he's helping the fire service. He's helping communities. He's helping leaders evolve. Uh, and, and for both of you, just so grateful for your time and sharing your insight and perspective to our listeners. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all for joining us and thank you to our listeners for tuning in. A link to today's article as well as Matt's article and Chief Kennedy's website can all be found in our show notes of this episode. If you haven't already, go follow us on social media where you can submit questions there or by emailing us at fireheadlines at wfca.com. We'll see you back here next week for more Fire Headlines. Fire Headlines.